Okay, I uh, think we're about ready to get started. So if people would like to come in and sit down, uh, we'll make a point of getting the show on the road. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Kathy Constable. I'm the president of the GP section. I'd like to welcome you to uh, the Bullard Lecture. This is uh, one of the privileges of rare privileges of being the president of the section is that I get to uh, select and introduce the uh, lecturer, person who gives this lecture every year. The Bullard Lecture honors um, Teddy Bullard, who was a Bowie Medal winner for GP. This is one of the Bowie Medal series of, of AGU-wide lectures. Uh, Teddy Bullard was uh, not just a distinguished member of the geomagnetism and paleomagnetism section, but a, a pioneer of marine geophysics. He worked in gravity and seismic reflection, heat flow, and uh, perhaps best known to members of our section, he was one of the first people who worked on uh, geodynamo simulations. Um, today's speaker, it, he was somebody who uh, spent a large fraction of his career between the United Kingdom, where he was based at Cambridge University, and in the summers he came to California, and eventually when he retired from Cambridge University, he moved permanently to California. He's also somebody who was a real pioneer of various methods and uh, innovations in geophysics, and this uh, lecture reminds us that he did those things, and we like to honor members of our section who have made uh, valuable contributions to our science. Today's speaker is uh, Dr. Suzanne McEnroe. She's uh, currently a Marie Curie Fellow, spending two years at Bayreuth University in Germany. Her home base is the Norwegian Geological Survey, um, and she's been there since uh, about 1994. That's not where she started out. She was educated at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, where she got her PhD in 1993. And um, in at the end of her PhD, she, she, was a, uh, she was initially, I believe, a hardcore paleomagnetist, and she, moved, she decided that she would take an NSF International Postdoctoral Fellowship and go to Scandinavia on a paleomagnetic project. She tells me that that didn't quite work out, but um, the Scandinavian bit did. At the end of the uh, postdoc, she thought, well, um, I could just come back to the US, but uh, the people at the New Norwegian Geological survey said, well, there's a job here. Wouldn't you like to apply for it? It's in Aeromag Processing. And she said, well, no, not really. <laughs> um, and instead, uh, she interviewed for that job and uh, said, well, let's not waste each other's time. I'm not interested in Aeromag Processing. I'm interested in the magnetic mineralogy of the lithosphere. And somehow or other, I'm not quite sure how, she talked them into uh, making her a job uh, where she actually studies uh, magnetic mineralogy of the lithosphere. And um, in that uh, time that she's been there, I would say she hasn't wasted people's time. Uh, she's uh, looked at the issues of trying to understand what makes magnetic anomalies, and in particular, what makes remnants in magnetic anomalies. Uh, many of you know that there's a substantial issue in trying to determine whether lithospheric magnetization results from induced or remnant sources. And uh, the work that Suzanne has done over the past decade or so, she's tried to move beyond the idea that uh, crustal remnants must be dominated by single domain magnetite. She's looked at uh, more complicated issues and moved into some serious investigations of nanoscale structures in magnetic minerals. Uh, particularly magnetic minerals that carry remnants in the Earth's crust. So what she's going to talk to us about today is uh, the topic of rocks that remember, those that preserve a record of the magnetic field in the Earth's lithosphere. So let me introduce to you Dr. Suzanne McEnroe. Kathy, thank you for the very gracious and uh, rewarding um, introduction. Was, uh, I hope I can live up to that in the lecture. Um, what I want to talk today is about rocks that hold their memory over time. Most of the samples I'm going to talk about are a billion years old or more, and how they've retained that remnants, and then how they affect magnetic anomalies. Uh, before I get there, I just want to mention some of the um, agencies that have sponsored my research in the last um, 15 years. The Research Council of Norway, 
where um, I've been funded both out of their Petromax program and developing exploration tools in, in magnetics, and also in the um, nanotechnology um, area where I've been funded to, to look at um, are there ways that we could reproduce these nanomagnets and use them uh, for present day applications and make future devices with them. Um, I'm very uh, happy that um, I've had a lot of support both from BGI, from Biro Geo Institute when they had an access to infrastructure program over the years um, and also from the European um, funding agency ESF. Um, I want to especially point out that the IRM has been a fantastic institute for us to go to who, have had to, who haven't had the facilities to run our, our magnetic experiments. This has been a wonderful service to our community. It's not only an institute which provides you the access to the instrumentation, they work very hard to have it well calibrated, to have it working for you, and also to help solve and, and work out problems with you. And a lot of my research um, has really blossomed from being able to go back and forth to the IRM. I also want to just take a minute and thank both the former director of the survey, Arna Bjorlicki, as well as the present director, uh, Morton Smelroar, and the science director, um, Oystein Nogo, for their support um, over the years. Uh, under the, in the title page here, I show Peter Robinson and Carl Fabian at the um, survey, as well as Richard Harrison in, in Cambridge and, and Laurie Brown. These are people who have worked very closely with me on these problems in the last decade. In addition, a lot of the work that I'm going to show you will be in Mossbauer, TEM. Um, we've used neutron x-rays. We spend a lot of time carefully characterizing these samples from a chemical as well as structural perspective. And there are many people that I've worked with on this and I'm not going to mention them each time. I've tried to cite the different papers with them. Um, they've all been outstanding colleagues, and they've all done a lot of work, and I appreciate it very much. So the subject of this talk is about rocks that remember. Rocks that retain a memory for a billion or, or more years, how they've retained that memory, and also the concept of, of crustal magnetism. We've, this is a time period where we've had the release of the magnetic anomaly map of the world. Um, we're mapping the lithosphere at a greater scale than we've ever done before. There's soon going to be the swarm satellites that will go up. And our resolution to map is just increasing at a level that we really haven't um, come up to the same level with understanding the rocks themselves. So technologically, we're making enormous advances in being able to map it. Do we understand what we're mapping? So when we think about the ocean, the first thing a modeler will do will consider remnants immediately. And we've completely accepted we've got a lot of remnants in oceanic crust. As soon as you move to the continents, most people dismiss remnants. They model the continental anomalies based solely on susceptibility. And that's one of the issues I want to bring up here. Is this a valid um, assumption to make? Now, of course, in a number of areas, yes, it is. Is it in all areas? And with our increasing ability to map, we need to think about this. We also have to think about in areas where we find mineralogy, which does preserve this remnants. What type of rocks are these? Um, and to what crustal depths do we model this? Um, do we, can, can we keep the magnetization? So here I'm showing a, a slide of Q values. This is something I'll be referring to throughout the lecture. Um, and this is a relationship between the, the remnants and the induced, anomaly, uh, the induced magnetization, which is a function of the susceptibility in the field, as well as the remnant magnetization, and that's the magnetization the rock required whenever it first crystallized or cooled through its Niela Curie temperature. Now, of course, if you have a high Q value, there's, the remnants could be from any direction if the rock crystallized in the southern hemisphere a billion years ago and now is up in the northern hemisphere. And if it has a Q value higher than 1, which will have a remnant component to it, or in many of these I'll show you higher than 10, dominated by remnants, then that magnetic anomaly is going to be related to where that rock first crystallized. So we could have negative anomalies if the remnants is in a direction opposite to the present day field. And it would be a positive, it could add to a positive in anomaly, an inducing component, if it's in the direction near of the present day field. So we can even see at a Q value of 2, how much the remnant component influences that, the, the total magnetization direction. So all the rocks that we're going to look at um, 
Many of them have Q values greater than one. That's the red line that I have on this diagram. The pink, the pink square rectangle there is a typical range for basalts that are based on um, more than 3,500 flows from Iceland. That's from Leo Christensen's data. Uh, Lori Brown's data in South America, a um, couple thousand samples there. And we're just looking at typical ranges for susceptibility and, and for NRM. Now, of course, there are many basalts that have ranges that are higher and those that are have are lower. I'm just giving you a visualization of where a number of relatively young basalts will plot on this diagram. Um, the areas that we, we can have very uh, low susceptibilities, this is the induced magnetization in amps per meter, and this is the remnant magnetization in amps per meter. Now, if you want to think about susceptibility, when we're over here, these rocks have susceptibility somewhere of 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6. They have very, very little oxide in it. You just need to put a few more oxide grains there to have the remnants go up quite a bit. These areas in here, we're looking at both layered, we're going to look at a layered intrusion, um, we're going to look at hemoilmanite ores, we're going to look at anorthosites and some um, hematites from different areas of, of around the world and, and just get a general feeling for what their properties are. Uh, the main point of this slide is almost all the rocks that I'm going to talk about have um, very high Q values. And to go into this subject in depth, I have to talk an, about another subject, and that's called lamellar magnetism. This is a, a magnetism, uh, a form of magnetization that we proposed um, back in 2002. And I'll, I'll, ex I'll go through what it is, and I'll show you how we've progressed in it going from a hypothesis now to a theory. And I want you to understand where it came from. And it came from originally working with aeromagnetic uh, maps and with samples, measuring the properties on them. And this is in southwest Sweden, um, where we have a granulite area, which is about 37 kilometers thick. And it um, pretty much goes down to the Moho, so that what we measure on the aeromag map is pretty much what we're, what we're um, sampling at the surface. There's no change in reflectors. And we have granulites here. Uh, we have a myelinite zone. And on top, we have an uh, upper amphibolite zone. And I have a net here just to show the bulk of the magnetization, the NRM, is, is negative, is steeply negative. This would account for the more, um, the, the negative anomalies. And we're looking here at the, the Q values from a number of these rocks. And one thing I want to point out is many of these rocks also contain multi-domain magnetite. And that multi-domain magnetite is going to carry a large uh, JI component, a large inducing component. So the remnants has to be much stronger than that to end up being negative. So what does this mineralogy look like? I'll mainly be talking about exolved hemoilmanite, and it's um, an ilmenite or a hematite, which is exolved the other phase. Often the grains are quite large, and then they have X solution that continues down to the very fine scale. And many of these uh, rocks contain, um, have quite significant remnant magnetizations. Now, when we go on to the um, TEM, we find that this these X solution lamellae continue down to a very fine scale. And in the, on the lower left-hand side there, you can see a scale bar to the 10 nanometers and, and 20 nanometers. This X solution lamellae continues to go down in size. Of course, we're getting to the point where actually these things should be super paramagnetic, which I'll bring up uh, later. Now, we have to look at the phase diagram. And in the phase diagram, we see we have a canted antiferromagnetic field in the red the paramagnetic disordered field in purple, and the PM uh, ilmenite field in the, uh, ordered in the right. We have an ordered disorder transition for the um, ilmenite ordering, and we have a magnetic ordering going from about 670 in centigrade, and it goes right down for the solid solution to 57K for ilmenite. Now, I'm not going to show many of these diagrams. I just have it to show you very similar properties for all this material. One, they're very hard to demagnetize. I think that's very evident. We rarely, if you have a hematite-hosted material, you, you don't demagnetize them below 100 milliteslas. If you have a hilmanite-hosted material, you start to demagnetize. You could have MDS maybe starting around 70. So this is one reason why it keeps this memory for so long. Uh, we have a variation on blocking temperatures, and that's going to be due to the chemistry. What's the amount of titanium left in solid solution in the host hematite or the hematite lamellae? 
The other thing is when we're doing hysteresis loops on this material, there's a large dependence whether you're parallel or perpendicular to the lamellae. And you can see a normal hysteresis loop there with maybe a coercivity about 170. If you happen to be running at perpendicular to the lamellae, that's just a minor loop. And it's in there, it's at least a coercivity of 80 milliteslas. So these are very hard, stable magnets. Now, what is this concept of lamellar magnetism? What we have are two phases that are intimately intergrown. We have a hematite, which is a canted antiferromagnetic moment with alternating layers and alternating AF moments pointing um, Fe3 plus layers. In the ilmenite, where we magnetize parallel to C, but this magnetizes only below 57K. And what we found, or what we proposed quite a few years ago, was at the interface between the lamellae, that there's a mixed iron layer there, an Fe2, Fe3 plus layer. This is a substructure. This is not a separate phase. But this is what's responsible for the bulk of the magnetization. So then the question becomes, is there experimental or theoretical evidence that, that could support, that could account for this type of magnetization, for this, to bring us back, to, to take us forward from just a hypothesis? And I'm now going to go through a series of different um, observations, experiments that were made that ends up show, showing you that we've, we've gone from a hypothesis um, to, uh, to a theory. And here we're just looking at a Monte Carlo simulation that uh, Richard made a number of years ago. And what we see is we see the different um, Fe3 pluses and different layers in the hematite. We see the Fe2 plus and the titanium and the ilmenite. And in, all, in the simulations that he would let run for a very long time, you always found this mixed Fe2, 3 plus layer. Um, the same interface configuration um, was, was predicted also by uh, Peter Robinson and looking at the uh, satisfying charge ordering and how did these irons like to be together. And this configuration also showed that the uh, Fe2, Fe3 plus was the most stable configuration to have at the interface. Probably the, um, the proof in the pudding came with the Densital Functional Theory calculations. And Rosica um, published this a year ago, where she looked at a, hemati at a hematite layer, or titanium layer inside a hematite. And what she found is when you had uh, X solution, that the preferred configuration is the titanium and the mixed iron, where when you had it alone, it wasn't. And I think this is probably some of the strongest evidence. Now, from an independent method, and I think this is a very exciting work that just came out, was Catherine McCammon recently made Mossbauer analyses on these grains here, and she used the milliprobe method. So you take a thin section and you drill out the grain. And the real advantage of this method is that you don't have to worry about impurities. You know exactly what you're measuring. The Mossbauer work we had done before, you take a sample, grind it up, and you'd measure it, but we, we had found this signal before, but it was always a worry, well, maybe a little pyroxene or something got in there. So what Catherine um, found was that she could um, take the, found the signal for the ilmenite, the Fe2 plus in the ilmenite, the signal for the, the hematite, um, the component, whether it was lamellae or it was the host phase, and also a contact layer phase. She, she was able to um, model out the contact layer. Now we're also, at the same time, we ran Mossbauer on synthetic samples of ilmenite 10 and 20. And we could find the Fe2 3 plus that was in mixture in solid solution there. But we also, um, this component was not present in the synthetic sample that did not show X solution. Um, recently, Takesha um, Kasama has done some very beautiful work using the TEM and actually looking at the in and out of phase, mapping the direction of magnetization, and trying to understand how many lamellae point which, which direction, and what's the re residual magnetic moment in this. Because one of the things, the amount of magnetization is going to depend on how many lamellae are pointing in what direction. So if we have lamellae in a hematite host, the, and so here we are, this is the ilmenite lamellae in a hematite host, the chemical location of the titanium layer will determine the direction of the lamellar moment. And the X solution of magnetic field um, itself 
isn't determined. Uh, we, we have a very stable magnetic configuration within the hematite host, and to r rotate the magnetic moment at the contact layer when you're in a hematite host, you're going to have to rotate the entire mate. You have to ro rotate the entire host. And this is um, why the coercivity in the hematite hosts are much higher than if you're in the paramagnetic host. When you're in the paramagnetic host, um, the ilmenite at room temperature and down to 57K is paramagnetic. And so you're capable of rotating the magnetic moment at lower fields because it, even though we're coupled to the ilmenite, the ilmenite itself is paramagnetic. Um, when we look at some of the sizes of the lamellae, I want to point out here this is just a TM image, and we can see that the scale of the X solution gets extremely fine. Now, when we look at um, AC uh, frequency, and here we're looking at fri five frequencies of susceptibility, and you see very little variation until you get up to near the ordering temperature of the ilmenite. Now, in the Allard Lake sample, where we have a variety of, of larger X solution with hematite hosted and also very small X solution, this is seven frequencies that we're running here, all the way down to five key. And 5K, and you see absolutely no dispersion in the data. You wouldn't, from this data, say that we have anything that is super paramagnetic. Um, in this region here, we have to move over to the low temperature phase diagram, which we've also done a lot of work in. And so here we're just at 0.6 going over to 1 in ilmenite component. And what you see, you have a paramagnetic field, you would have a ferrimagnetic field over here. But as we cool down from our paramagnetic field, that sample which showed some dispersion enters what we call PM prime. Ishikawa had uh, originally did this diagram, and he labeled this SPM. But it's not a particle size. We do get a lot of dispersion in here. It's a, it's a, a clustering of irons in the TI layer that start to produce this um, dispersion in the data. And we, our Allard Lake sample, we're at about ilmenite 98, so we never pass through that field. We just go right into the AF ordering here, where that other composition we have as low as ilmenite 94, and so we pass through this field before we become to AF ordering into the spin glass, and that's what is giving the dispersion in the data. Um, we've done MFF work, and we find that we get a very good signal from the lamellae um, using the magnetic force microscopy. The other, um, I think, very important aspect is when we take this material and we, in this case, we've applied a, a IRM and we've cooled it down to 5K and we've let it recover both in, in field-free conditions, that we get almost 100% recovery in this material. And this is really a, a evidence that this material is exchange coupled. So some of the important points of this material is it has very high unblocking temperatures. In slowly cooled rocks, we tend to make many generations of ex-solution lamellae, and these lamellae would continue down to the very fine scale. The subunit cell size lamellae are magnetically stable, and these lamellae are stable even, even it looks when we're getting to, to extremely fine grain size. We're talking just a nanometer wide. And so, of course, if we can find a way to... Um, make this material in the laboratory, it actually has a lot of economic value. So now I just want to take a traverse to some different parts of the world and look at some of the mineralogy and see how it, it behaves and what type of anomalies are associated with this. And here we're in the Adirondacks and we're looking at a beautiful negative anomaly and um, we've done ground mag over here and here's the mineralogy. It's a nice titanohematite with X solution of ilmenite and rutile and porophenite. And you can see the very, we have many, many samples, hundreds of samples which run very high coercivity and high in blocking temperatures. And you can see that the Q values from this region are extremely high. And this is because we have very oxidized rocks. And the rocks that are very oxidized will have very little magnetite in it. And most of it is a titanohematite. And these have high remanences and they also have very low susceptibilities. One of the very nice studies done with this in the TEM by Takesha was that we took three samples, two which had very high NRMs of five and eight and a half amps per meter, and one which had a very low NRM of just 0.5.
And the samples which had the high NRMs had very, very fine um, X solution lamellae. And the samples which didn't, the sample that did not have a high NRM actually just was hematite, and the hematite had a little bit of rutile in it. And I think this was a very nice correlation between the mineralogy and the actual amount of magnetization. We're going to move to Norway, some two very good field assistants here, and we're moving to some anorthocytes, and anorthocytes are very commonly thought of as carrying a very low magnetization. Um, the anorthocytes in Norway all have negative, most of them have negative anomalies, and I just want to point out here, we do have anorthocytes which have hemoilmanite, we have anorthocytes with hemoilmanite and magnetite. Um, you can basically see here that the, the NRM is much, much higher than the deuce magnetization, and this is what is causing the negative anomalies in the air, and these are all about a mi minus 70 inclination. So we have the anorthocytes in this region. We're going to look at a layered intrusion here and look at the magnetic properties and the anomalies correlated with the layered intrusion. This is an area which is the second largest active um, hemoilmanite mine in the world, and actually my first job was to actually try to find another source. And so here's some of the hemoilmanite. We can see here the exclusion of hematites about two microns wide. And then if we go down to the TEM, we can see the hematite exclusion here with many generations of ilmenite. As we move away from a, an exclusion, we find very, very fine exclusion. That there's a, a zone between it which has very little exclusion. In this region here, there are two things I want to point out. Mostly what you're seeing here is strain shadows. These uh, lamellae are extremely fine. We're just at a few nanometers. The other thing is probably the last set of X solution came out as a supersaturation and precipitation. And we've done a great deal of work studying the compositions of these to try to relate them also to the magnetic properties. So this is a very old uh, fixed-wing survey, and so we're going to look at the layered intrusion where we have uh, early part, we have a negative anomaly, and then as it evolves, it becomes a positive anomaly. And we were looking at um, results from the Anorthos Anasera and the Heller in Holland and the Garsak uh, over here and the Agerson Onya. Now, the nice thing about this layered intrusion is it's been studied by petrologists for over 100 years. So we had a great deal of data that we knew about it. And what is interesting is at the very early part of the intrusion, you crystallized ilmenite with hematite X solution. As the magma evolved, the ilmenite loses its hematite component and you just end, w you end up with ilmenite with no hematite. And you, magnetite doesn't come in until later on into the crystallization sequence, and you actually have uh, end member magnetite, and we actually end up with uvospinel magnetite as we crystallize. We sampled the entire intrusion. We've done ground mag through the intrusion. The early part, we have magnetic lows. When magnetite comes in, we get a very large magnetic high, which has a low associated here with it. And then the different layers with the different... Um, Mineralogy gives us uh, different responses. And this particular anomaly here, the Heskestat area, has an enormous negative anomaly, and we'll try to understand why it has that anomaly. This is just a picture of an outcrop showing some of the layering in the, the D unit. And here we've just plotted the relationship of the remnants to the induced anomaly. Early on, we have hemoilmanite. We see it's dominated by remnants. We'll have recharge events associated with the C and um, with A layers here that are uh, hemoilmanite rich. And then as we progressively crystallize, magnetite comes in, and then the inducing component takes over. But then we have another recharge event, and we have more primitive magma. We have hemoilmanite that comes back. And then as the magma continues on a course of crystal, fraction, crystal fractionization, we have more and more um, magnetite coming in, and the induced uh, magnetization dominates, except for this one layer here, which has this absolutely enormous magnetization. And what we're looking at here is a relationship between Q value, NRM, and susceptibility. And in the black are the hemo rocks with hemoilmanite. In the circles here, we have magnetite-bearing rocks. In the triangles, we're looking at this very unusual unit in Heskestad, which has a significant amount of magnetite, but also a very, very high um, NRM values. And at the Q, as you can see, the Q values in this layered intrusion vary a great deal, whether in the magnetite-rich rocks or we move into the more hemoilmanite. But the ones with the high susceptibility, the high-induced magnetization, have the highest magnetization of all of them. 
So we're looking at the southern end of this negative anomaly here. We're going to go down and look at a high resolution map of this end of the layered intrusion. And here we can see that the, the Sockendell part of the layered intrusion follows the geology. Very beautiful here are the anorthosites, the big titanium mine, a lot of historic um, hemoilmanite mines in here. And there's a, this in the anorthosite, we're back into hemoilmanite, we're here, we're all have magnetite. And we want to look at this is the southern tip of that long anomaly I was talking about. And here's a 3D image of this anomaly. And from the helicopter, this is um, about a minus 12,000 nanoteslas. And this material has a couple percent multi-domain magnetite in it, and it has hemoilmanite. Um, in these rocks here, we can see we're in the magnetite-rich rocks. We're in some of the anorthosites where we have quite a bit of hemoilmanite. And another uh, area in Midland, which has an anomaly not comparable to this, but quite large, which also has um, a quite a bit of hemo. The, the amount of oxide in the, these, both in the Heskestad and in the Midland, is not very much. We certainly have less than probably 4% oxide in there. And so our question really was, how do you get these type of anomalies? Up here is an inset. We've just shown the modeling from this. And we needed approximately, um, it was almost 24 amps per meter to model the anomaly. Now this intrusion is seven kilometers thick. We're in an area where it's very steeply dipping. We're at the edge of the intrusion. So we know what we're measuring is act, what we're sampling is actually carrying the magnetization. And this is just um, to show you that we're in the magnetite-rich rocks. You can see in this um, swivel here with a magnet pointing in the direction of the inducing field. And when we go to these Hesksad norites, it actually flips. So the, the crustal field from this rock is, is canceling out um, the local inducing field. And what I'm showing here is the rock itself. It's a 2 pyroxene norite. Um, it's got orthopyroxene, clinopyroxene, it's got multi-domain magnetite, it has hemowilmanite, it's got some apatite and plagioclase in here. And this is just a map made by, using the GMR scanning technique that Fatima made. And what we see is very distinct anomalies. We see very little over the um, plagioclase. Here is a chemical map, and I've overlaid two chemical maps on here. I, I'm mapping iron and I'm mapping titanium, so we can see the ilmenite and we can see the orthopyroxene and we can see the magnetite. And this way we can start to try to correlate what minerals are, are, car are carrying these, these anomalies. And we, I chemically map both top and bottom. This is just a few millimeters, maybe 10 millimeters thickness. And so then we can bring in the... Um, the, the map, this is the map was made about 40 microns above the sample, and we can start to associate what anomalies are related to what minerals. Um, we're still doing quite a bit of work with this, and we'll be modeling individual areas and looking at that in relationship to the minerals themselves. But we were stuck with the problem that the hemoilmanite, there's not enough in there to be causing these anomalies, the strength of the anomaly. Um, and so we there had to be another phase, and what we did find is there was very distinct areas that were related to the orthopyroxene. Now the orthopyroxene, this is a TEM image, high resolution, and we have orthopyroxene, we have a little sliver of, of a lamellae of, of clinopyroxene, and then we have ilmenite, and in the ilmenite we have a, quite a bit of hematite lamellae. And it was very hard for us to consider that this material really could be significantly contributing to the anomaly, and the reason is that even though it has X solution in it, the amount of X solution is still less than 1% of that grain. However, the, there does seem to clearly be a relationship between that GMR mapping and the orthopyroxenes, in addition to the hemoilmanite. And what we do know is these, there's a very strong fabric here, and the orthopyroxenes are, are oriented, very strongly oriented, in the C-axis of the um, orthopyroxene, of which we have the ilmenite coming out on, which then has the hematite coming, um, is almost directly down the proterozoic magnetizing field. And we know that direction because the anorthosites, we have the directions from the anorthosites there. So we do think that there is very much a role of fabric in preferred um, orientation and that the number of lamellae that are oriented in, the, in a similar direction is playing a role. But hopefully in a year or so, when we've modeled the anomalies from that map, we'll be able to be more conclusive. 
So from that perspective, what we're trying to do is take the aeromag and we're trying to directly relate the rocks to the magnetics that we find at the aeromag um, uh, surveys and then map them at this scale and then understand what the magnetic interactions are that are leading to these type of anomaly. So I want to move now to Allard Lake in Canada or Lecteo. This is one of the largest, this is the largest active um, ilmenite mine in the world. And here we have ilmenite with multi -ge multiple generations of hematite. We have coarse hematite and we have very fine hematite. And we have a very distinct aeromagnetic signature over it. Um, the Q values are, are very high. And of course, we're working with a lot of material here. The ores are you know, nearly 90% of a lot of the samples. So you'd get very high remanences. The susceptibilities vary. Some samples have multi-domain multi magnetite. Most of them don't. But we do, we do see that. Um, so here's the path of crystallization that we would have taken with, the, with, with uh, Allard Lake. Would have, it, it had approximate original bulk composition of around 72. It would have crystallized. It would start to exolve quite early. And this is how we developed the large coarse X solution. And then that X solution would have then um, further exolved and create finer X solution, both in the ilmenite host as well as in the hematite host. And we've, the, the final X solution um, comes out, um, it's never end member, but the, the ilmenite end is more towards end member than the hematite end. Again, the basic magnetic properties, we have extremely high um, AF, uh, medium destructive fields. Uh, very little variation in any of the samples with um, alternating frequency susceptibility going down temperature. And also, as I'd explained earlier, a large range in coercivity values. However, many of the samples, those which do not have magnetite, um, plot way up. And of course, this is a, a diagram for magnetite, but you can see the nature, the hematite nature of the titanohematite X solution. Um, when we look on the TEM, again, we see a large variation in X solution sizes. Um, the chemical difference between the X solution isn't very much. We tend to get a very similar composition, whether we're looking at large X solution or small X solution, and this probably has to do with late stage equilibrium. Now, looking at these rocks, we can say, okay, these are rocks we're measuring at the surface. What about deeper in the crust? What's the magnetization at depth? And, of course, Norway's a natural um, laboratory for this. We have rocks that have been down to 100 kilometers or more. And I just simply want to point out a number of these rocks have both rhombohedral oxides with the X solutionum and the magnetite. And, of course, the X solution would have taken place at higher, um, it'd have to be cool enough for the X solution to take place. So it didn't take place at 100 kilometers. But it's still it was at depth in the crust. And um, also, what's the nature of the magnetic material? Now, to look at this, we're going to actually move down to Rogaland again, to where we find the, um, the hemoilmanites that we're working with there. And so the question they had is, if these lamellae are, sta are, are these lamellae stable down at 580 degrees, or are they reabsorbed? And if they are stable, then they're going to contribute to magnetization at depth in the crust. So we did a series of experiments where we went to 580 degrees, 10 kilobars, and we left the samples first for about a week and then 21 days, and that was nearly a month. And what we found is basically the lamellae started to coarsen. They weren't reabsorbed. We had the hematite component and the ilmenite was, was being reabsorbed, and it appeared that the hematite lamellae themselves were coarsening up. Um, we were never really satisfied that we got to the bottom of that answer. We did a lot of detailed chemical work. We also did a lot of work with the um, X solution lamellae. It was very clear the hematite lamellae had ilmenite lamellae in them. But the ilmenite itself was losing some hematite. This is based on the chemistry. We did key chemistry both at the microprobe level and the TEM. Um, we also induced a lot of um, twin deformation in the samples. And the twin deformation probably is what's responsible for some of the change in coercivity that we have from the ilmenite sample to the sample that was recovered. But also, we are having some coarsening of hematite. Now, what this led us to, to think about was the fact that if these lamellae aren't being reabsorbed, what's happening? What's happening to the solid solution at depth? 
And what we came up with is that the, the solvus itself appears to, there's an effective pressure on the solvus. Um, Le, uh, Simon Redford and Richard Harrison looked at new transit pressure in this region in the iron, in iron titanium in compositions here. And what they found is the ordering increase with pressure. And based on that observation, along with our observation that the lamellae were not being reabsorbed, but that they were stable, um, we felt that there probably was a stability to the solvents at depth in the crust. And therefore, we have to consider the fact that these lamellae are there and that they will contribute to the magnetization. And then, of course, if one thinks about this further, when we were looking at the Swedish granulites or other rocks, what we found was that the, the lamellae were very coarse. Um, I was dissatisfied with the fact that I didn't feel we had really answered the question about the difference between what was happening in the hematite lamellae with the ilmenite and what was happening in the ilmenite with the hematite lamellae. And so I used an Allard Lake sample because here the initial um, lamellae are, are, some of them are very coarse, and in this way we could be looking at a hematite host as well as an ilmenite host in the same experiment. Now what happened after 30 days, 10 kilobars, and at 580 degrees wasn't very satisfactory. Nothing really happened. I mean, the TEM chemistry shows that there was hardly any change. Um, the magnetics also showed there was very little change except for enhancement and coercivity. And you can see the recovered sample um, is quite, quite fractured. Um, there was a lot of deformation twinning we found in this. But what we found is the original Curie temperature and the temperature after the experiment weren't very different. Um, we see very little difference in the susceptibility um, data with frequency. We see a little bit of difference here on this side, which I think might be a little bit of hematite going into the ilmenite there. Um, and again, we see a little bit of change in the coercivity. We have a slight enhancement of coercivity. I think basically what we found is we probably were near to the conditions where the Allard Lake was crystallizing. It probably was around 10 kilobars. But this certainly tells us that this mineralogy is stable. And the reason I picked 580 to do the experiments um, was because that's where we model out magnetite. And the primary question was, one, do we reabsorb the lamellae? And the other one was, is there anything we should think about at temperatures above 580? And this certainly is a mineralogy where we do have to think about that. Now, I briefly want to move to the Black Hill norite in, um, in Australia. And this also has a, a very beautiful negative anomaly associated with it. And here we have magnetite with some minor oxyex solution of ilmenite. We have pyroxene with ilmenite X solution and a little bit of uh, magnetite in there. And we also have ilmenite. And at first I thought we're looking at hematite in here and went to the probe and we didn't get very good hematite numbers and I was, I was bothered with that and we, we tried it again and we came up with the, the same numbers. So we went to the TEM. And what we found is here, this is a common zone axis and it's a high resolution image and we're looking at Im ilmenite, the host is ilmenite, those lamellae are hematite. They had very odd terminations to them. I mean, they're, they're magnetite. Um, so this is a very beautiful example where we have ilmenite exolving magnetite. The only thing that's a little bit worrisome about this rock, which is actually very interesting, is ma magnetite coming out of ilmenite is most likely a reduction. At the same time, we're seeing oxyex solution of um, ilmenite and magnetite. And so there's some very interesting uh, questions about how quickly really do the oxides re-equilibrate. Now, um, we're also doing a lot of work on synthetic samples. And this is an ilmenite 40 sample that actually um, was made quite a few years ago by Ben Burton. I've been analyzing all his samples left over from his thesis when he was originally studying the hematite ilmenite solid solution. And this sample showed a uh, shifted hysteresis loop at very low temperature. And we were wondering what could be causing that. And so um, we went to the TEM. We did a lot of magnetic experiments. We went to the TEM. And what we found is there's both uh, ilmenite 40 and there's magnetite in the sample, but the magnetite's only um, six to seven nanometers wide. And what we see here is um, some MRS and MS curves. And you see with uh, infield magnetization that we have a high magnetization, which is lost at about the blocking, unblocking temperature of the ilmenite 40, but then we continue to have a magnetization from the magnetite. 
But if we look at the MRS, the remnants there, we lose both the ilmenite 40 and the magnetite. And the reason, the reason it has a magnetization, those small grains, is they're coupled to the ilmenite. And as soon as that ilmenite loses its magnetization, those very fine lamellae can no longer carry a remnants. But they will still have an infield magnetization to them. Um, if we move now to Peculiar Knob in Australia, and this is a very interesting deposit, but it's under about 40 meters of uh, cover. And here we're looking at a, there were a series of dural cores that Phil Schmidt had got, and the question was from the exploration company whether or not they had missed the target. There was a nice big positive magnetic anomaly and they thought they had a really big magnetite deposit. And so they had some drill cores, and they looked at the drill cores, and a lot of the drill cores contained abundance of hematite. And so they said, well, did we miss the target? Um, but I want to just point out here what it took to model this anomaly. Um, we needed the, the anomaly needed 120 amps per meter to model. It's an enormous remnant that's being carried. Of course, this is an ore deposit. And here we have a... Um, large, very large millimeter sized grains of hematite and the hematite themselves um, never gave pure hematite analyses. And this was really quite frustrating. Um, I just want to show you some of the properties here. We have very high remnants. Of course, remember that these are almost 100% oxide. But we also have coexisting magnetite with it and the real question is within these very low susceptibility ones do we have intergrowth of another phase? And here what we see are just some MS and MR curves and you can clearly see there's more than one phase in them and just on the, the right here what we're looking is at a fork diagram from the very um, low susceptibility high remnant samples and it it certainly wouldn't be modeled as a multi-domain hematite. So I, I, we're trying to do more work on the TEM to look at what's the nature of these intergrowths that are in this material. Um, the last sample that I'm going to show you from this part is from the Alaco deposit in Chile. And um, this is a hematite-rich sample, which has very high coercivities from what you can see from the um, Hysteresis loops here, the, uh, actually they're fork loops, and you can see an extraordinary coercivity. And again, we had the question, what do we have? Because if we go in at the SEM scale or the microprobe, we're pretty much getting hematite. If we go to the TEM, we have two phases there. And again, we believe these phases are exchange coupled. And the second phase is a maghemite. And so this very fine intergrowth is what's probably carrying the magnetization there. So what... What we've been looking at, and I'll just spend the last 10 minutes to look at this, is we've been looking at materials which have an exchange coupled um, nature to them. They have, in one way or the other, a type of contact layer, a type of defect moment on it. And they have very special properties. They're very high coercivity. They have very high temperature stability. And there's a lot of interest, actually, in this type of material because if you needed to have a one-time read device or something that could take a higher temperature for both defense and space applications. So understanding the nature of the magnetization could also become a template for future thin films. And so the last rocks we're looking at come from the Modem area in Norway. And here, um, these are metasedimentary rocks, which have a, uh, quite a negative um, inclination or give negative anomalies. This here is the... Um, ring dike complex from the, Ar Ar from the Oslo Graben. Now these are, are very interesting because many of them have very, very low susceptibilities. And of course the remnants aren't very high, but the susceptibilities are enormously low. And then over here we have really quite relatively good remnants and still with extraordinary low susceptibilities we're looking at at 10 to the minus 5. And, and when you look in thin section, the sample here, you just see a beautiful titanohematite. You see some ilmenite. You see, I mean, you see rutile, and you see corundum, but you don't see any uh, ilmenite. So we can see here that the modem sample would have crystallized. It would have started to make ilmenite, and it would have continued possibly to make um, finer scale ilmenite. Now, this material has very interesting low temperature properties. Um, and what I show you here is the TEM and where we see this nanoscale X solution 
and we have both the iron and titanium maps, and what we find is this X solution continues down to the um, subunit cell size. Here we're looking at a series of hysteresis loops going from 300 down to 70. And you get very normal behavior going down temperature, just a slight hardening of the magnetization due to lowering temperature. Now, when we go down to um, 10K, uh, you have to wonder if the machine's working. We have a, a significantly shifted uh, hysteresis loop here. And we, of course, did correct it, check to make sure it was um, working. And of course, uh, shifted hysteresis loops, which is a reflection of exchange bias material, that's how you make giant magnetoresistive heads. And this material actually um, is colossal. Um, so here we're just looking with temperature at the center of that loop. So at 60K, we're centered, and as we go down temperature, you can see the loop continues to shift further and further. Now, between 50 and 60, uh, 50, 60 and 50, what happens is ilmenite orders. And here, the ilmenite is only at the subunit cell size. As soon as that ilmenite orders, we start to have a shifted loop. Now here, th those loops were minor loops. So we had to go up to higher fields to measure this loop. We went up to um, seven Teslas. And the shift of this loop here is 1.34 Teslas. Now this is the largest shift that's ever been found in any material, natural or synthetic, and the only one that was close to this was actually found back in the 50s. It's a um, cobalt cobalt oxide. So understanding the nature of this coupling, how do you get material that can do this, is something that will be used to try to make templates for future devices. But it's been very hard to study in this field. People have had a hard time explaining how you get shifted hysteresis loops, and there are thousands of papers on this. Now, here we have material that we can study the nature of the interface, we can study the chemistry, and we can understand what is causing the shift. We haven't fully done that yet. Um, now, what I want to show here is this is just an NRM cooling and warming. And what's really remarkable about this is we get an absolute complete recovery. You can see here we have the room temperature state. As we go down temperature, the ilmenite orders. It orders in the opposite direction. Remember, it's parallel to C. And then as we warm back up, it completely recovers. And you can only do this if, you're, if your material is coupled. The other thing I want to mention about that uh, his, the hysteresis loop is other experiments we did. We took the natural material without applying a field and just took it right down to 10K and ran a loop and it was shifted. And what that tells you is the NRM itself is causing the shift. So we've done quite a bit of work using uh, small angle scattering, trying to understand the size of the melee, also with magnetic fields to see if we could find which, which way is the, um, is the hematite tilted out of the basal plane, is the ilmenite tipped, tilted out of the C axis. So we could try to start to understand how you get these very large shifts. And you can see here, these little arrows here are showing you these lamellae, and the scale bar there is 1.4 nanometers. The remarkable thing now is we were doing this on 8 milligrams. This was something you couldn't have done 10 years ago. So the, the advances that are being made in mineral physics and the amount of material that we can actually go and measure in these different places is really giving us a tremendous ability to understand the nature of the magnetism of these materials. Um, shown here is a Monte Carlo simulation of trying to understand how the material shifts. And we have an equilibrium state and we also have the shifted state. And when we have an um, odd number of of lamellae in the, at the core, so we have a shell and core, we will get a shift. When we have an even lamellae, an even number, they'll both shift and you'll end up with no, they'll both rotate and you'll end up with no shift in the loop. This was the first step in trying to understand how, which moment was shifting and we thought there was probably a very good chance that the hematite was rotating out of the basal plane. Um, we also thought, we, we thought this also because the anisotropy, the ilmenite, is extremely high compared to the, to the hematite. So here we're at the, um, just, just a sketch of the exchange bias state. This, um, these results are coming from a neutron powder experiment we ran uh, last, uh, last winter. 
and this is, this is now in review, but what we found in the neutron um, experiment is that the, it, the hematite is rotated out of the plane. And it's not only rotated out of the plane down at very low temperature, in this, in this material with these very nanoscale lamellae, we're seeing it's rotated out of, out of the basal plane even, even at room temperature. Um, another aspect that uh, Carl's been working a great deal with Valeria is look, modeling this material and modeling what happens when you have a nanodot in an AF matrix and what happens when you, uh, uh, nanoscale ones, and what happens when you rotate these in a very high field and how you could possibly cause a certain amount of exchange by this rotation and then whether or not they're going to behave as clusters or as single particles. So what this work has been trying to do is to understand the nature, to, to determine the chemistry, understand the microstructures, understand the nature of the lamellae as well as the uh, coupling across the layers. These are materials that give us these wonderful magnetic anomalies that can um, keep the anomaly for over a billion years, probably four or five, it wouldn't matter. Um, we try to model and understand them. We also know that this material has a lot of interest to develop future devices to look at for thin films and other aspects. So now we've reached the moment of Zen, and this is where I, how I visualize the magnetic field. This is in the Northern Lights in Finnmark, and I thank you very much for your attention. Are you prepared to take a question or two? Yes. Uh, <laughs> do we have any questions out there? No? If not, well, I'd like to uh, really take this opportunity to thank you that, for that phenomenal survey of uh, the work that you've been doing and uh, that's been going on in this field over the past decade or two. Um, it's really impressive to see how much progress has been made. Uh, so please let me uh, join me in thanking Suzanne for this. Bravo. Thank you. Never mind. Oh, that's mine. That's supposed to be No, it's for you. I was supposed to present it.